Hopsabuto. I'm the lead pastor of Pocosin Baptist Church. PBC exists to glorify Jesus by shepherding sinners from loss to leader. And a large part of what that means is that we are people passionate about following Jesus as he reveals himself in his word, the Bible. When you attend one of our worship services, I hope you'll see that the Bible is central to everything that we do. If you'd like to learn more about Pocosin Baptist, you can visit us at www.pocosinbaptist.org. God bless, and we hope to see you soon. Good morning. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we come before you now to thank you for your goodness. We are all struggling mightily right now, Father. There are so many things going on in the world, from famines and floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, fear of sickness, Lord, from COVID to cancer, students that have to learn a new way to learn because their schools are closed, jobs that are lost, finances that are tight, food chains failing, store shelves emptied, Lord, just so many things, and the one that hurts the most that we cannot gather together as a church family. We're really struggling, Lord, and we find it easy to lose our focus and to, to think about our circumstances more than we think about you. We lose our perspective, Lord. So I pray that you would help us to remember that you are good, that you are in control, that you know the plans that you have for us to give us hope and a future, that you have promised to work all things to our good and your glory, that you are more than able, Lord, to accomplish what concerns us today, that you will complete the work that you have begun and that you are faithful and oh so good. We have tasted and seen that you are good, that even in our darkest hours, you are with us guiding and helping and upholding us. So we thank you and praise you, our good God. In Jesus' name, amen. How great the
Good morning, everyone. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Father, this morning we confess our sins related to motherhood and your design for the relationship between a mother and her children. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. We see in being obedient to our parents, your plan for us to learn to be obedient to every authority in our lives, including you. And yet in our culture today, we see such a lack of obedience, respect for teachers, law enforcement officers, and even you, and the chaos and turmoil this has created. So we pray this morning that you help us return to the basic principles in your word of mothers and fathers teaching and expecting their children to obey them and ultimately obey you. As we see when we come to passages speaking of the relationship between adult children and their mother and father, a subtle shift to a language of respect and provision. So we pray that you will help us to respect our parents and ensure they are appropriately provided for. As we see in 1 Timothy 1.5, where Paul, was, um, Paul is talking to Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I'm sure, dwells in you as well. Your plan is for mothers to lead us to you, and we thank you that most of us, maybe even all of us who are praying this morning, have been blessed with mothers who have done this. Again, we see in our culture today mothers who do not know you and do not follow the example provided for us in 1 Timothy. They not only do not teach their children about you and your son Jesus, they actually mistreat their children, which at times even leads to death. So we pray that you would help us reestablish a culture where mothers and fathers know you and understand the responsibility given to them by you to teach their children children that are given by, that uh, you have given them about you and your son Jesus. We also live in a society today where killing an unborn and more and more recently born children is a right that uh, some mothers claim and feel comfortable exercising. I thank you for people like Don Carnes who is faithful in sharing with young mothers who are considering abortion what your word says about that and provides alternative options for them to consider that protects the life of these babies. I thank you for organizations like Care Net Peninsula, which works hard to provide alternatives to expecting mothers so these babies can live to have the opportunity to fulfill the plans you have for each of them. So we pray this morning for a return to a culture that protects these babies and allows mothers to love and care for the children in the manner you intended. We ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen.
morning. We are going to now rehearse the New City Catechism together. This week we're on question number 19. I'm going to ask the question and then you're going to uh, repeat along with me the answer. It should be on your screens. So here's the question. Is there any way to escape punishment and be brought back into God's favor? Uh, will you answer it with me? Yes, to satisfy his judgment, God himself, out of mere mercy, reconciles us to himself and delivers us from sin and from the punishment for sin by a redeemer. Would you bow with me and let's pray together. Father, we have brought our adoration and our confession to you. Now we want to give you thanks. And today we want to specifically thank you for the gift of moms. God, every single one of us that watch this broadcast, uh, all of us have or had a mother. And Lord, what a gift a mom is. Lord, by, by your grace, by your common grace, uh, even if our moms are not or were not believers, for many, if not most of us, you, you gifted us with good moms, mothers that, that cared for us, mothers that were nurturing, gentle, and kind, mothers that, that taught us things about your world and perhaps about your word. Lord, we thank you for the way that you have designed women, that you have made them equal and yet different. And you've given them different responsibilities and roles. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of mothers in our life. Lord, we want to pray now as we bring our requests to you and begin by praying for our own church family and specifically for uh, the moms in our church family. God, I pray for moms at PBC whether they're moms uh, of young children or adult children, we pray that they would be holy as mothers, that they would be faithful moms. We pray that they would be used by you to point their children to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray for moms-to-be in our church family. Lord, for mothers that um, are, are carrying children and, and preparing for the, the joys and the challenges of, of motherhood. God, we pray that you would prepare them even now to be moms that would faithfully point their children to Jesus. Lord, I pray for uh, women that wish that they could be mothers and uh, up to this point they have not been able to conceive. God, I pray that you would comfort them, especially on a day like Mother's Day that can be hard uh, for many. Lord, we pray that you would encourage them by your love, that you would fill them with your spirit, that you would fill them with joy, and that you would give them a name better than sons and daughters. God, we pray not just for our own church, we pray for our sister church. And today we pray for Alexander Baptist Church and Pastor Brian Ray. And Lord, I pray, uh, as uh, Lord willing, we get closer and closer to the day when we can gather together uh, once again in our state. Lord, we pray that Pastor Brian would have great wisdom as he seeks to prepare the people of Alexander Baptist for whatever that might look like. Lord, we pray that you would help this church uh, to, to thrive in the days ahead and to be a great witness to the lost in their area. 
And Father, we pray not only for our brothers and sisters, but for our country. And today we specifically pray for families all across the United States that suddenly find themselves homeschooling. And for many of those families, the, the burden is likely falling on moms. God, we, we pray for, for these families, these moms and dads, and maybe grandparents, foster parents across the country that weren't prepared for this, that, that maybe didn't want this. Uh, Lord, we pray that they would see uh, in, in this opportunity, Lord, uh, an opportunity to grow closer to the children that they care for. Lord, we pray that you would protect them from, from undue stress. Lord, we pray that you would help them to, to really be able to be involved in the lives of their children in a way that perhaps they hadn't been before. And Lord, we pray for the kids that find themselves suddenly homeschooler children. Uh, we pray that they would continue to learn and grow and that this would be a season of great learning and prosperity for them. But we pray not only for uh, our country, but we pray for the world. And today we pray for the nation of Seychelles, this collection of islands north of Madagascar. Lord, we pray for the people there, many that don't have access to your word, many that profess to be Christians but continue to uh, live in light of the voodoo religion. God, we pray that your gospel would shine brightly in these islands and that many would come to know and believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, now as we turn our attention to your word, we pray that you would use your word to shape your people. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would preach louder than I can preach and do what I cannot do and speak to the heart. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. What makes a good mom? I read two articles. One had a really short list, and one had a longer list. The first article said that you can tell you're a good mom if, number one, your kids smile 90% of the time, and number two, they say please and thank you without being told. Now, that's a short list, but everyone who's ever spent more than a few minutes around children knows that a metric like this would leave many moms discouraged. We constantly tell our children to say please and thank you, and yet it seems like it's an afterthought for them. And smiling 90% of the time, really? Well, let's move on to a longer list. Maybe we'll find more encouragement there. Here's another list on what it takes to be a good mom. A good mom loves her child unconditionally. She never hurts her child. She always does what is best for her child. She always puts her child's needs before her own. She always wants to be around her child. She should always feel that the most important thing in the world is her child. She should always be happy staying home with her kids all day. She never resents her child. She should feel the only thing she needs in her life to feel happy is her child. She shouldn't feel bored spending time with her child. She should feel happy and overjoyed every time she looks at her child. She should never think about how enjoyable her life was before kids. She should be able to handle kids all day without needing breaks. And she shouldn't feel unhappy at night when she's up late with her child. Now, I've been around some amazing moms, but that list would not encourage any of them. Uh, these types of lists lead either to pride or despair. Pride as moms, you compare yourself to the other moms in your life that, that uh, are not doing quite as good as you are. You know, my kids smile 40% of the time and her kids only smile 20% of the time or something like that. Or despair as you look at these sorts of lists and you realize how poorly you measure up. Well, today I want to give you a, a better way to measure what makes a good mom. I believe that a good mom is one who loves her children less than she loves her creator. Please turn your Bibles with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. So if you've been a part of the PBC family for a while, you know that we've been studying the book of Lamentations together. But in honor of moms today, I want us to think about the beauty of broken motherhood. I want us to think about what it takes for a mom to love her children less than she loves her creator. 
To do that, we're going to look at a story in 1 Kings chapter 17. But as you're turning there, we need to understand what's going on at this point in the story of the Bible. Uh, this is nearly 300 years before the fall of Judah, which is described in the book we've been studying, Lamentations. Uh, the kingdom of Israel is still divided in two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, but neither kingdom has yet fallen into exile. A man named Elijah was a prophet in the northern kingdom, and one of the things he's been doing is, is rebuking and preaching against the northern kingdom because of their sin. Uh, let's get introduced to him in verse 1 of 1 Kings chapter 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Now, things are going pretty well for the prophet Elijah. Uh, there's a famine in the northern kingdom shore, but the good news is Elijah successfully prophesied that it would happen. This was big news for a prophet, to watch your prophecy come true. And in addition to that, it's really not affecting Elijah because by God's provision, he's eating two square meals a day, which would be normal in those days. Well, meanwhile, things have gone from bad or from good to bad for a single mom just north of Elijah. Let's look at her beginning in verse 7. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, to Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Now, we don't know a lot about this woman. In fact, the Bible doesn't even tell us her name. We know she's a widow, although the Bible doesn't tell us how her husband died. It's quite possible that he died due to the famine, but we can't be sure. Now, I'm told it's never easy being a widow, but in those days, it must have been especially difficult. There was no Social Security, no Medicaid, no food stamps, little child care, uh, little jobs that were available to women. Now in Israel, God had made specific provision for widows, different ways that they would be cared for in the nation of Israel. But this widow lives in Sidon in a town called Zarephath. She's not a part of the people of Israel. So she is not free to receive those blessings that the Israelite people would receive. Well, the text tells us she lived in this town called Zarephath, and, and Zarephath was in the kingdom of Sidon, as we said, in the northwest tip of the nation of Israel. Now, there, there are certain locations that if I mention, it's going to bring up an association for you. So if I said Foxborough, many of you would, would think of the home base of Tom Brady, until recently, that is. Uh, or if I said to you, Memphis, you, you might think of, of barbecue or, or the blues or Elvis Presley. If I said Louisville, you might think of the Kentucky Derby. Uh, some places have negative associations, negative connotations. So if I said Wuhan, you might think of the, the initial beginnings of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, if you lived in Elijah's day and you heard someone talk about Sidon, you would immediately think of it as the home base for the worship of a god named Baal. Sidon was, in fact, the birthplace of Jezebel, the princess of Sidon, the queen of Israel, the high priestess of Baal. So there in Zarephath, in the heart of Baal country, is a single mom who's running out of food. Uh, this single mom lived in a broken world, in a broken nation, surrounded by broken gods. Her motherhood was a broken motherhood. 
Maybe that's where you find yourself today, keenly aware of your brokenness. Maybe it's financial brokenness as you're struggling to make ends meet, or physical brokenness because you or someone you love has a serious disease or sickness. Maybe it's relational brokenness because someone you love won't talk to you, or perhaps because when that person does talk to you, it always ends up in a fight. Or maybe it's, it's the brokenness of guilt as you reflect on, on something harmful that you've done to someone you love, maybe even your own children. Maybe it's spiritual brokenness because someone you love is distant from Jesus, or maybe because you feel distant from Jesus. Maybe it's the brokenness of, of losing a spouse or a child or a mother or a father, or maybe it's the brokenness of not having any children at all. There's one thing that is inevitable about motherhood, fatherhood, marriage, singleness, everything in this world. In a broken world, all of it is broken. And to make matters worse, as we're learning in Lamentations, often, often we're the ones that did the breaking. Now this mom in Zarephath likely questioned why this was happening to her. After all, she lives in the kingdom of Sidon. This is, the, this is the home field of the god Baal. And that might not seem significant at first until you realize that Baal was a storm god. He, he was the god that was responsible for sending rain to his people. So this woman is, is kind of like a, a Catholic living in the Vatican or a Muslim living in Mecca or a Mormon living in Salt Lake City, a, a baseball player living in Cooperstown, an actor or actress living in Hollywood, or, or an investor living on Wall Street. She has home field advantage. Her regional God is the God of storms and rain, and surely she must be crying out to her God, don't you see what I'm going through? Don't you know? Don't you care? As you look at the brokenness that surrounds you this Mother's Day, you might be asking your God the same question. Don't you see? Don't you know? Don't you care? I would suggest to you the answer to those questions depends. It depends on who your God is. You see, Baal didn't see Baal didn't know, and Baal didn't care. But the God of the Bible did. He's, and he's on his way to Zarephath. And that same God sees your brokenness. He knows, he cares, and he knows your address. Now, we're not careful. We might be tempted to think that things are immediately going to get better God has sent a prophet to Zarephath. He's going to come and fix everything, and it's going to be happily ever after for this poor, suffering widow. Not so fast. After things go from good to bad, they quickly go from bad to worse. Look with me at verse 10. So Elijah arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city... Behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and he said, Bring me a little water in my vessel that I might drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. Now, if, if, we, if we're going to understand the weight of this passage, we need to understand that this widow is starving. She, she's down to her last meal. 
She's undoubtedly been, been praying and sacrificing to Baal, hoping for a miracle. We know she doesn't believe in the God of the Bible because she refers to him when she talks to Elijah as your God, not her God. So as she cries out to Baal for a miracle, for rain, no miracle comes. And in deep discouragement and desperation, she, she gathers some sticks and prepares to make one final meal with her son before they both die of starvation. And then a Jewish prophet shows up. And he notices she's getting ready to make a meal. And he has the audacity to ask a poor, hungry, widowed, single mother to make him something first. One of my favorite books on fatherhood is a novel by Cormac McCarthy called The Road. It's set in a dark, gritty, post-apocalyptic world where food is scarce. It tells the story of a dad who is willing to do whatever it takes even kill or let others starve in order to feed his son. Now, I know that dads and moms are different, but, but let me just tell you this. I, I know my wife well enough to know that there is not a chance that some rando could show up in our front yard pretending to be a prophet, say, bake me some food, and that she would somehow be willing to give the last of our food to someone she just met. Not a chance. But this unnamed widow is about to teach us a valuable lesson. The path to beautiful motherhood. It's a broken path. The, the, the path to the kind of motherhood that loves children less than the Creator is the pathway of surrender. If we think about it, this shouldn't surprise us. 900 years after the story of Elijah, another prophet would show up in the nation of Israel. And this prophet would also require surrender to a handful of fishermen he would say, surrender your nets. Leave behind your careers, your livelihood, the way you provide for your families. Leave it all behind and follow me. This prophet would go to a rich young ruler and Jesus would say, surrender your wealth. If you really want to follow me, then you need to love your neighbor more than your stuff. To any of us who would seek to be a disciple of Jesus today, he says to us, surrender your lives. The Gospel of Mark says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Maybe this is where you find yourself today, keenly aware of your need to surrender. Let me ask you, what is it that you love the most? For some of you, it might be your children. Maybe it's your job, your status, your social media accounts, your boyfriend or your girlfriend, your video games, your physical health, your possessions. Regardless of what it is, Jesus is coming to you as a prophet greater than Elijah, and he says to all of us the very same thing, surrender, surrender. But why is it that God wants us to surrender? Please understand, it's not because God needs what we have. The Bible tells us he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The silver is his. The gold is his. If he needed anything, he wouldn't tell us. It's not that he needs what, he, what we have that he asks us to surrender. And it's certainly not because he doesn't want us to have anything. The Bible tells us every good gift comes from above. God has created this world filled with good things that he intends for us to enjoy. So why is it that he asks us to surrender? So that your trust will rest on him alone. 
He wants you to hold on to him, but you cannot do that unless you have empty hands. And so he says, surrender. When Elijah demands a meal from this Sidonian widow, he's not being selfish or mean. He's telling her to empty her hands so that she can hold on to the God who loves her more than she loves herself. Notice that Elijah doesn't just demand a meal. He makes a promise to this woman. Look in verse 14. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. Elijah is promising this woman, if you surrender, God will meet your needs. If you empty your hands, God will fill them. The same is true today, dear brothers and sisters, for all who are in Christ. Listen to what the scripture says, Philippians 4. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, this is not the promise of a sleazy prosperity preacher. Paul wrote both Philippians and Romans, and Paul knew what it was to endure suffering. He knew what it was to surrender. Paul knew even what it was to be hungry. Notice that both of these promises are promises not that we will have everything that we want, but that we will have everything that we need. And notice that it's God who knows what we need, not ourselves. So as we wrestle through this pandemic, and you find yourself down to your last roll of toilet paper, it may just be that God knows that you don't need any more toilet paper. If, as we're hearing, the meat supply runs thin and you find yourself unable to have steak or chicken wings or a pork butt or anything else, any other meat to eat, then it may be that God knows that you don't need it. Lord knows I don't need it. Well, God promises to give us not what we want, but what we need. Notice with me how this widow responds to Elijah's audacious request. Can you imagine somebody you just met coming to you and demanding you make the, the rest of your food and give it to him? Notice how she responds. Verse 15. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. So this poor, starving, widowed, single mom responds with incredible faith. Imagine watching this prophet you've just met eating the last of your food. Based on what? A a promise that a jar and a jug that you've just emptied will never run out? That's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And God responds to this woman's faith with promise-keeping love and power. Maybe that's where you find yourself today, keenly aware of the promise-keeping power of God. Maybe you're in a season of, of great blessing, even despite what's going on in the world, God is being very good to you, and you're seeing him do great, wonderful things in your life. If that's true, praise him, but beware, because when God keeps his promises, we're sometimes tempted to delight in the gifts more than the giver. On June 1st, 2002, uh, despite a complicated pregnancy, Ruby Caroline Faith was born. Uh, She was born with a rare heart condition that could have killed her either in childbirth or shortly thereafter. But God protected Ruby. 
And a few days from now, Ruby will graduate from high school. But as Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Exactly four months after Ruby was born, her older brother, my little brother, Adrian Edmund Giles, died in a freak accident in a swimming pool. Are you prepared for things to go from worse to worst? What will you do if what God gives you, he takes away? How will you respond? Look at what happens next in the story. Verse 17 after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. He's gone. And she says to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. In her grief... This woman expresses the fears that we are all too familiar with. If I allow God to get too close, will he take something from me? If I give my life to God as a blank check, where will he tell me to go? What will he tell me to do? If I sin against God, will he punish me by killing someone I love? If I'm suffering now, is it because God's angry at me? This is the moment where many people lose their faith. I was following Jesus, and look what I've got to show for it. I lost everything. I'm done. Maybe this is where you find yourself today, keenly aware of your doubts and your sadness and your pain. Dear brother, sister, friend, God is not done with you yet. He may take you from good to bad, from bad to worse, and from worse to worst. But he loves you too much to leave you there. He's not done with you yet. And he wasn't done with this widow either. Let's watch as he takes her from worst to worship. Verse 19, and he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged, and he laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, oh, Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times, and cried to the Lord, Oh, Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. In other words, I believe, she says. This is a powerful scene. You got Elijah interceding uh, before God on behalf of this woman. We've got his body stretched out over the top of a dead boy. God himself showing up and resurrecting the boy, breathing life into lungs that had stopped working, helping a heart to beat again that had stopped beating. And then you've got this poor widow right in the heart of Baal country singing the praises of the God of Israel. Now, as beautiful as this story is, we need to stop and ask ourselves, why? Why? Why would God do all of this? Why send a famine to take away this woman's husband, perhaps, and definitely her food, only to restore the food later? Why save this boy's life 
from starvation, only then to take it away. Only then to resurrect him in the end. Perhaps we might ask questions like this. Why put me through all these trials that I'm going through? Why a tiny grave for a baby boy? Why a pandemic? Why a shutdown? Why cancer? Why a lost job? Why? Why, Lord? Because God wants to show us that he is better than all the puny gods that we worship. God is everywhere. Baal was a regional god with home field advantage in the kingdom of Sidon. And God steps into Baal's backyard and he did what Baal was powerless to do, provide food for a hungry widow. God is all powerful. Baal was worshiped as the god of rain, fertility, and the vanquisher of death. But Baal couldn't send rain. And Baal couldn't resurrect that boy. So God shows up and God flexes his muscles and beats Baal at his own game. God is merciful. Baal wasn't merciful. He was a violent God. If you remember from 1 Kings chapter 18, the next chapter, the prophets of Baal, his own followers, have to cut themselves just to try to get their God's attention. They had to suffer to earn his mercy. No wonder this single widowed mom asks Elijah, is your God killing my son because of my sins? But God shows mercy towards an outsider. God is doing all of these things to show us that he is far better than all the puny gods that we worship. Why should we love the Creator more than our children, more than anything else? Because He's better than all those things. Recently, I heard about a commercial for Pfizer, pharmaceutical company, and the commercial was talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and everything that's going on, and uh, there was some line in the commercial that said something like this, science is the one thing we can turn to, the one thing that we can trust. What is that but just another bail? Dear Christian, our God loves to show up in lands filled with puny gods and beat them at their own game. And that's what he does in First, First Kings chapter 17. But I, I want to suggest to you there's another reason why God allows this woman to go from, from worst to worship in order to point us to Jesus, the hope of the world, the, the, the reason we're able to love our creator more than anything else, even more than our own children, is because we know that Jesus has given himself for us in a way that no one else ever could. Think about the contrast. Uh, worshipers of Baal shed their own blood in hopes to wake their God up. Our God shed his own blood in order to wake us up. This woman feared that God was killing her son because of her sins. In reality, God would one day kill his own son for her sins and the sins of all who would believe. And just as God raised her son from the dead, God too raised his own son from the dead so that all who trust in him might have life. So moms, stop looking at lists to measure your motherhood. Instead, learn to love your children less than you love your creator. Even if that means that in life, sometimes you go from good to bad, from bad to worse, and from worst, from worst to worst. No matter how bad life gets, remember that God and His grace and power and mercy will take you from worst to worship when your eyes are fixed on the one who died so that you can live. Would you pray with me? 
Father, we thank you for the glories of the gospel. Uh, Jesus, we thank you that you were the son that was willing to die so that we could live, that you rose from the dead, and then that now you willingly, gladly extend open arms to whoever would repent and believe, whoever would call you, as Thomas did, my Lord and my God. Oh Lord, I pray for those who've watched this sermon. Lord, I pray that if there's someone that does not have a relationship with you, that, that right now they would cry out to you, they would believe this good news, they would turn from their sin and trust in Jesus. And for we who are your people, moms and dads, singles and married, all of us, young and old, may we learn to treasure our creator more than anything else. Even if at times life is hard, even if at times things go from good to bad and then all the way to the worst that we can imagine, may we praise you May we say, as Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to leave you with a benediction from Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 20. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.